Hello, everyone. My name is Gus. Hi, I'm Woody. Today we have. Is it uh, cold in here? No. Today we have a, a weird. Not that I'm oh, that's hat. right. You don't have a hat. People that, are going to lose their mind. Just that in itself could be the whole video. Just the comments <laughs> of he's bald. And well, all right, I, go ahead. So I haven't watched this whole video, but I know kind of the person who makes this video. And I think it's probably going to be a little bit gross. But the topic of this video is what happens when you drown. Like physiologically, what does your body go through when you drown? Really interesting. So I don't we, know if we're going to react to it. but I don't know either. But I do know we've had a lot of talk about drowning, what it would mm -hmm. feel like. Are you aware? Is it painful? Like we, a bunch yeah. of videos on that. So this, this is interesting, I think. Let's see. Let's give it a shot. When I was in the Marine Corps, I participated in a specialized form of swim qualification called the Hilo Dunker. This is a this simulated like helicopter crash inside of a swimming pool. So picture like this big metal tube. There are seats, there are windows, and you are strapped to this seat. Not in this full gear, awesome. but uh -huh. you are in boots, camis, you have a Kevlar helmet, a rubber rifle, and most importantly, blackout goggles because they want to make your life as difficult as possible because they will then submerge you and then they will rotate the entire structure around in the pool to disorient you and your job is to detach yourself from the harness and the seat, pop out a window, and then swim out to safety, hopefully not drowning in the process. It's pretty intense. Wow. By the way, I met a lady who was an instructor on this. And we, it was back in the day, we only had like eight subscribers. So I couldn't like talk my way into getting invited <laughs> to do this. Um, but if you're watching this, I remember your name or any of the instructors or anyone who knows anyone who can get us in to do this, please reach out. I would, I would love to do this. I agree. Absolutely love to do this. And while that may sound enjoyable to many of you out there, yes. I knew plenty of guys that was enjoyable. I hated it. Oh. I did not like that at all. And that's because on one particular submersion, things did not go my way and water just, I will inhaled vast quantities of water. And when you have blackout goggles, you're strapped to a seat, and you've been spun oh, around, man. that whole situation just induced a panic response in me. Mm. I was literally drowning in that moment. And now obviously I made it. That's because there are qualified swim instructors who are observing everything, and one of them recognized me in, in the situation and took me out of there, and I'm obviously here to tell the tale, but I will never forget mm. that panic. That sensation is so unique, it's so scary, and that's what I want to talk about today. Because as horrifying as it actually is, it's also very fascinating to understand. So we're going to use the cadavers to look oh. at the lungs, breathing, see exactly wow. what's going on during the drowning process. You no, know, that's look at it's that. It's interesting. Terrible. Let's do this. What is this? Oh this is God. good one. According to the World Health Organization, drowning is the process of experiencing a respiratory impairment from a submersion or immersion in a liquid. And that's probably the most obvious thing in the world to you. I mean, we are talking about drowning after all. But the thing to understand is you can survive a drowning and still say that you drowned. If you're rescued at any time, they term that a non-fatal drowning. Then if you die as a result of the drowning process, then we call that a fatal drowning. So for me, I can actually I may, say that I drowned. I may have been able to figure that out. I'm yeah. just saying. I'm not a scientist. You know. When that I was, was in the helo dunker, but I would say that I suffered a non-fatal drowning. Let's quickly discuss some risk factors associated with drowning because some of them might actually surprise you. So the first one I want to talk about is age. And the younger you are, the more likely you are to drown. We find worldwide, under the age of 15, a high risk of drowning. Now, if you're a one-year-old, you're obviously going to have a higher risk than, say, a 12-year-old, but still simply being under the age of 15, yeah. higher risk overall. Yep. Males are going to be more likely to drown. And we find this is likely because so males tend to take bigger risks yeah, do than this females kind of do stuff. on average. Maybe <laughs> Which, uh, he jumps off a cliff or something. Maybe uh, they're, he's drinking around, like say in a boat or something along those lines. It's Again, it's not that females don't drown, it's just that males are more likely to drown than females. Uh, not other, being yeah. able to swim, this one's probably super obvious to you, is a pretty big mm -hmm. risk factor. Definitely. But what's interesting to me is that most drownings tend to occur in fresh bodies of water. So that's lakes and rivers. Huh. We do find drownings occur in swimming pools and in mm -hmm. oceans, but by far they actually happen in fresh bodies of water. Wow. Epilepsy. Uh, picture this, uh, you're true. in a bathtub and you have a seizure. That's obviously a very, very dangerous situation. 
Intoxication, like I just already mentioned, is a big factor, but that can happen for males and females. But yeah. being intoxicated around water is never a good thing. I mean, people have drowned in <laughs> bathtubs, they've drowned in puddles, they've drowned in toilet bowls, believe it or not. So I hope what? I'm not surprising anybody by, by saying that or drinking in their own and being up. around bodies of water, not the best combination. And then the last one is actually exhaustion. This, uh, I mean, you could be a very good swimmer, but you're in a very bad scenario. And if you're too tired, you are going to go through this drowning process. You are now looking at a right human lung. And Ugh. I want to quickly mention that this is a healthy lung. I know a what? lot of people are going to see this darkened color here and assume that maybe this was a smoker's lungs or unhealthy lungs in general. But these are healthy looking lungs. This darkened color here, these are blood vessels. And this is exactly what you would expect to see. These lungs are pink. There's also some dark purple pink. on the backside. Again, this is exactly what you'd want to see. So wow, these are very healthy wild. looking lungs. But the lungs are going to be squishy. So uh, that's because it's made of elastic tissue Permable. so it can expand. So it feels very similar to a sponge. But then attached to it is going to be this long tube here that we call the, the trachea. Inflator hose. Or the windpipe. Oh, the trachea. Never now, mind. this is just a transport tube. <laughs> I mean, it looks like it. Look at it. This is just a transport tube, and it's just transporting air to and from the lungs. And then up. His name is Gus uh, for the comments, not okay. Up top, <laughs> we have the larynx or the voice box. Now, the I can voice turn this box. around. This is pretty cool. And you can see this awesome cross section oh, of the larynx. Amazing. Now, I did an entire video all about laryngeal anatomy, so you should go check that out after this video. What kind of anatomy? But what I want to do not. right now is just laryngeal. briefly discuss breathing and how it works. Now, Obviously. actually, Jonathan made an entire video on breathing itself that you should also go check out after this video. So this will be a real quick and easy version of it. But when you breathe in, I mean, obviously, it's going to go through the mouth and the throat. It's going to then go through the larynx. And it's going to go past down the air. The oxygen is coming in. And then it's going to go down. Let's see if I can turn this around. And you can see yeah. uh, the inside of the trachea. It's not all that exciting to look at because it's no. just a hollow tube in there. But the air is going to go down until it gets to the lungs, and that's where the trachea, as you can see, as we look at this medial surface this here, is healthy? the trachea begins to branch, and it branches a lot. And this branching is just going to fill up the entirety of the lungs. So it's just gonna look branch, 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 look branch and branch until it becomes microscopic. What? These little tiny air sacs at the end of all the branching are called alveoli. Uh, I never could say and that alveoli word. Alveoli are going to be surrounded alveoli. by blood vessels tiny little blood vessels called capillaries. That's what bursts, by the way. This is where you a, you're I'll going to on. have oxygen Problem. go into the bloodstream. It's going to diffuse into the bloodstream, attach to hemoglobin, and then just, which are on the red blood cells, and then Obviously. go out through the hemoglobin. entire body. That's what I was thinking. At the same time, carbon dioxide will then leave the bloodstream and go into that respiratory tract and then just do the exact <laughs> opposite trip that oxygen just took. It's going to then get exhaled Amazing. going up and out. Now that's but a rebreather. This is actually pretty important. We need to discuss this real quick. The fact that oxygen is used by cells to make energy. It's extremely important. At the same time, cells produce carbon dioxide. That's a waste product. It is very important to get carbon dioxide out of the body, out of the bloodstream. And if you don't, there are going to be some pretty intense consequences, and that's exactly what we're about to see. Now, the whole drowning process can be said to occur in four stages. Now, you could subdivide those stages even to even more stages, but I think four is going to be just enough. But it's important to understand that all four of those stages typically happen within just seconds to minutes. It's a very quick process. Now, it can be much more prolonged. Let's say you're swimming and drowning in very, very, very cold water, and then you begin to suffer from hypothermia. In that instance, blood is going to start draining from your appendages, like your arms and your legs, in order to keep your core and your brain warm and give them oxygen. That means you are going to consume overall less oxygen, because not a lot is going to your muscles. So that can actually prolong the drowning experience. But I this think it's probably good best for us to assume that this so good, entire right? process is going to be happening within just a few minutes at most. In the first stage of drowning, there is going to be a voluntary breath hold, and you are going to hold that breath for as long as you possibly can until the urge to breathe completely overwhelms you. I mean, this one's probably going to make a lot of sense, right? It's like, right? you're swimming, you're swimming, you're drowning, you're trying to figure out the situation, you're doing whatever you can, but eventually that breath is going to start to go yes, away, like, right? The <sighs> oxygen is going to get burned through, and as that happens, you're going to become more desperate. Now, to understand why you're so desperate, there's a few terms we need to talk about first. Hmm. The first one is called hypoxia. 
Hypoxia is when you have Oxy. low levels of oxygen Oxy. inside of your blood, even though you have enough blood flow to an area, right? So it's not like there's a tourniquet <clears throat> or something around there. Now, the next one is called anoxia. Hmm. Anoxia is where there's a complete absence of oxygen to the organ or tissue. That can be very, very bad because if there's no oxygen, cells can die very quickly and you can have an irreversible permanent injury. That's going to be important coming up. The next thing is called hypercapnia. Hypercapnia is when you have too much or elevated CO2. levels of carbon dioxide inside of your bloodstream. Remember, carbon dioxide is that waste product that you're supposed to be breathing out, but here you are, holding your breath, so it's just accumulating inside of your blood. And that can actually have an effect on the pH level, right? The, it lowers the pH level of your bloodstream, turning it acidic. We call what? that respiratory acidosis. So your blood yeah. just starts to become acidic, but your body's not just gonna let you do that, right? Say like, if you were just holding your breath at home right now, which hopefully don't, you're not holding it too long. I mean, if you hold your started. breath, like eventually you're gonna get to this point where your body's like, look, <laughs> I'm not just gonna let our blood turn to acid. So what it causes is an inhalation reflex, right? So you get to this point where you're just completely done and then it's <laughs> desperately you're going to inhale. But that's gonna be a pretty big problem and that's gonna to lead to our second stage of, of drowning in a second. But just understand that as these carbon dioxide levels are rising and rising, that's gonna to lead to panic and seizures. This is that point where it's like you're realizing what's happening, the carbon dioxide's rising, panic and seizures are coming in, and so out of desperation, the inhalation reflex kicks in, and you are now in the second stage of drowning. Which is, so you probably see what's gonna happen here, death, right? So as you your lungs with water. do that, and you're in water, that water is now gonna go into your respiratory tract. So let's take a look at the lung here. Ugh. We'll go back to this larynx, get that in focus, and as we turn it around, so what you're gonna see here is this little flap. This is called the epiglottis. And this is supposed yeah, to block obviously. off the airway so water does not go into, or food doesn't go into your respiratory oh, tract. Oh, like a snorkel. But as you have that inhalation reflex, it's going to open and the water is going to get down into that larynx. I thought an That's epiglottis a was a dinosaur. It doesn't want to do that. I mean, me. I, I did an entire video actually of substances going down the wrong tube or the wrong pipe. So you should go check that out after this video. But I'm sure you've been there. If you've ever had water go into your respiratory tract, it immediately initiates a cough reflex. So you're gonna <coughs> to get it out, but that's another problem. Here you are in the water, just <coughs> and more water is going to flood in. So in 10% or so, around 10% of drowning victims, they do find that they uh, underwent Can't what's called water. a laryngospasm. Oh. That is where, and it's gonna be hard to tell, but I'm touching with my fingers right now, the vocal cords. I, the vocal this. cords, are gonna be on either side, and what's gonna happen is they're gonna slam you shut. Cannot Again, breathe. this is about 10% of so drowning victims. They slam shut in an attempt to prevent more water from going down into the rest <laughs> of the So remember I told you when I had that water pellet a few times yeah. shoot into me? Snipe you and you're like this, courts. you're like <laughs> Yeah. And I know and I know it's gonna clear. I, this happened to me at 330 feet underwater. I'm not kidding. 100 you. meters, yeah. And slowly you you get like <laughs> And that's already an improvement. That's an improvement, right? A little bit, yeah. and it slowly opens back up. But when it first time it happened to me and it snapped shut, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I said, I'm done. I cannot breathe right now. And they heard me there, the rebreather divers going, as it opened back and up. Whale. I've had this happen a few times. Really <laughs> weird. At the same time, there could also be, I'll grab the section here again. We'll open this up. You see those branching tubes? Yeah. Right here, these branching tubes are part of the bronchial tree. Those can also spasm in what's called a bronchospasm. So those can also slam shut in a desperate attempt to seal off and prevent water from going down into the respiratory tract. And this is because your respiratory tract is not Amazing. capable of digesting and absorbing water. So this is all just <clears throat> this pathway exists to just get it out. But here you are fully immersed in water this is not good, and this is going to lead us to the third stage. And it's at this third stage that you've pretty much burned Stab. through all the oxygen that was available to you. And so you're no longer in a hypoxic state. You're now moving into an anoxic state. And that means trouble. It just spells trouble for pretty much every structure and organ and tissue in your body. But As it's especially night. troublesome for this organ right here called the brain. 
Now you're looking at a human cerebrum here. It's really awesome and amazing to look at. But what I want you to understand is that this organ, which is around three-ish pounds or around 1.4 kilograms, this three-ish pound organ consumes 20% of your daily calories. That's what? enormous. That's I because there are no about idea. 86 billion neurons well, in yours inside is of like this thing, eight for all six. consuming <laughs> oxygen to work. But here you are, you've deprived it for an extended period of time now of oxygen, and now what's happening is those 86 billion neurons are beginning to die. And when they die, you're not gonna get them back. This is, at this point, you are, you are at an irreversible injury. Consciousness is lost, and things are starting to shut down. The inhalation reflex completely ceases. You start which, thinking that pizza with pineapple is good. You start thinking that split fins are okay. Pork's okay to eat. You, that's not, do you see? You went too far. That's 6% working right there. fourth <laughs> stage, and it's at this point too much. Far too many of the neurons have died, and at this point, the brain just dies. You suffer brain death. At what stage do you think Nickelback makes good music, do you think? <laughs> and it's completely irreversible. This and is at this point, we can say the individual yeah, has cool. suffered a fatal drowning. But remember, if you're rescued anywhere between that first and third stage, that means you experienced a non-fatal drowning. But that does not mean that you come away unscathed. Because if you got to an anoxic state, and depending on how long you spent in that anoxic state, that means you're going to have suffered brain damage. And that obviously can be very variable, right? There's little brain damage and there's a lot of brain damage that you can still survive from. So depending on how long you're in that state, that means a lot. So while we can definitely say that I experienced a non-fatal drowning, I obviously didn't get anywhere near that anoxic state. I mean, I definitely got to that second stage where I had the cough reflex, the inhalation reflex. Mm -hmm. I definitely had aspirated water, but luckily, that swim instructor was able to get me out in time, remove the water, and I didn't suffer any cerebral injury. So for that, I will forever be thankful to that swim instructor wherever you are. Awesome. First of all, really awesome. Good wow, job. Wow, what a great explanation. And, and by the way, when we, when we have a lung over expansion injury, it's the Ebola that's rupturing. For those of you, it's not that. Did you say Ebola? The Ebola? The, <laughs> the Ebola. The Ebola. Alveoli? Uh, the alveoli. Yeah. Those little bubbles, they explode. Not the spongy lung part. Uh -huh. That's often misstated. Um, but for me, this was an amazing explanation of the process of drowning. But what it doesn't tell me, but other people have, I guess, talked about that experienced it, that didn't get brain damage, hmm. is it a painful process. Remember where he said you're at that point where you hold your breath and you can't anymore and you're going <clears> to <throat> breathe yeah. in water? Yeah. Is it just so painful at that point that you have to take in water and then when the water is going in you, is it painful? Is it like are you suffering or are you just ending up going basically hypoxic because you have no oxygen yeah. flowing through you and you just fall asleep? I I think we've had discussions over this. Okay. Yeah. I think you fall asleep and then you drown and maybe you're in pain while you sleep, but you don't feel anything. It's like when you get surgery and they put you to sleep and you don't feel anything during surgery, even though they're cutting you open. I think it's that kind of thing. But was there any point leading up to that falling asleep that you're, you're really suffering? You're, you're mm. just like, just don't, you know, you know, when you hold your breath, mm -hmm. It gets painful if you don't take a breath. That I I, I it's, wonder it's terrible. I wonder how long that goes on for. Yeah. The moment that you suck in the water, is that over? The pain's over. Now you're just like you said, you just pass out. Anyway, I keep having this same thought, so I don't know. I don't know. But we have talked about this in the past. Last time we talked about whether drowning is painful or not, and I feel that we didn't arrive at a consensus. One of us must be wrong because we have different opinions. And I think that's also the same thing that happened in the comments. People are debating back and forward. But if you haven't seen that video, I'm going to leave it right here. Go and check it out. Is it painful? And there's a bunch of people who's like, I've drowned seven times. And I was in horror. Why are you drowning seven times? <laughs> Why? Why? What life choices are you making? 
You think you would learn after the first one? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> How many times do you have to drown? Right. Although we're going to sell, we're gonna, although we both just said we want to get strapped into this helicopter-looking oh. thing, twisted upside down, and possibly do drown. That would be amazing. 